Nearman Condition, the home of Collected oh, Edition. That cover is so awesome. Absolute format is the best way to own this store. Time to empty those wallets and fill those shelves. How's it going, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today as I take a look at each and every one of these hardcovers, and there is one soft cover here, from Humanoids. So, please stay tuned. And welcome back, everybody. So, before I get started, I do want to thank the kind folks at Humanoids for sending us copies of these books. All of these books are now in the book market and the direct market, so you can find these everywhere. We have a lot of hardcovers and then one soft cover that I think it was previously released as a hardcover. I'm not sure 100%, uh, but we, we're looking at a variety of different things here, which is something that I love about this publisher. I've done an overview and gone in deep about the different types of books that Humanoids has released here in America. But these are the ones that they've released in the last couple of months. So let's go ahead and start. We'll start with, let's do the Inkow Dying Star. The book we're kicking it off with is part of the Inkow universe. This is now expanding into different writers and different artists. Of course, the Inkow universe, all created by Jodorowsky and Mobius. Now, it's really interesting because there was an introduction in the very first book. This is the second book. This is called The Dying Star. And it's introducing it again here in these particular pages. And it's just a note from Jodo himself talking about how, you know, if I was in my 50s, 60s, I don't think I'd let anybody else write the stories around the world of the Inkao. But because I'm a man in my 90s, sure, let somebody else write it. And that's what's going on here. So we have Dan Waters writing the story. And we have John Davis Hunt drawing these particular stories. Now, I know John Davis Hunt from uh, Clean Room, which is an excellent read if you've not read it. So what this is, is again, in the world of Inkow. But the beauty of these type of books is that if you notice here, they focus on the title. The big bold letters are The Dying Star. Inkow's at the top, right up there. So you know it's in that particular world. But you don't need to have read the Inkow to enjoy these stories. Because I feel like this kind of stands on its own. And this has been my favorite one. I know there's only two so far. I think a third one's coming out later this year. But what I like about this one is the different sci-fi and almost like a romantic story. It reminds me of one of my favorite episodes of the 80s Twilight Zone, which is very underrated, by the way. A lot of Ray Bradbury stories. I don't know why people don't talk enough about the 80s. Maybe it's because some people find it blasphemous that it was in color instead of the classic black and white. And I love Rod Serling, one of my top 10 favorite series of all time. But 80s Twilight Zone is also good. And I'll get to that point here in a second. So we meet this character right here. This is Commander Cayman. And Commander Cayman is in charge of this pirate ship where his crew is with him and they all treat him with respect. They follow his orders. However, you find out that his crew has been dead for a while. And he's talking to these holographic creations done by the ship and it's really cool how this works now what is going on with Cayman is that interesting that that's his name of course because he suffers from this condition where he is turning into a reptile like a giant crocodile Cayman right so you get it and he's looking for some cures. And one of the cures has led him into the ship where he goes in here and invades the ship. Uh, he meets this young lady right here and he notices that he has the, uh, she has this flower that he needs because that's how he's going to find this cure. So he takes the flower and, of course, slaughters her and the rest of the crewmates, blowing up the ship completely. Now, what he doesn't know, but only the reader knows, is during this time, we also meet this nun years in the future, thousands of years in the future. And this is Aurora. And Aurora is telling the story of Cayman. And this is where it gets really interesting, because when he left the ship, he also takes what is inside of a case. He cares about the flower, but this young lady is guarding this case. So he takes the case with him. And without him knowing, inside the case is this violin. And this is a Ceritonius Mourner. So what this does is that 
when you play it, the music will just transcend all space and time so that only your true love can hear it. However, he can't play it because he's turning into a reptile, but this flower that he has is temporarily curing him. So when he does play the violin, a young lady appears in front of him. Now she is solidified, like she's not a hologram, she's actually time traveling from the future, and she tells him all about how her world is about to come to an end. And they have this connection immediately, because, you know, at first he's like, what are you doing on my ship? Who are you? Who sent you? But then, of course, they kind of start falling for each other, and he makes it his purpose that no matter what, he is going to transcend space and time, kind of like the violin, to save her and her world. Because, like I mentioned, her world is coming to an end, and there's nothing she can do. Man, this was so good, and, and like I mentioned, does not really... Have, well, it does have a little bit to do with the in cow, but I don't want to say exactly what. And actually, the more you read it, the more you'll see. Oh, that's how it's connected. But definitely stands on its own. It was one of my favorite reads out of this batch. Actually, all oh, these books are excellent. It's going to be hard to choose the pick or the seal of approval for this batch. Now, this particular book retails for $24.99, and it has 128 pages all the way in the back is a map of the Incal universe. So it tells you exactly when to read this book. So Dying Star is number 13 after the Psychoverse, which is the other one I've done an overview of. And that one was excellent too. That one was written by Mark Russell. But you have all these other side stories. I haven't written or read that one, Cymac. Huh. I'm slacking here. But all the other ones I have. And then a little bit of what the Psychoverse is. And then coming out this year... Oh, dude, it's Kill Wolfhead? Okay, that definitely has to do with the Incal universe. That was one of the main characters. As far as the binding of this book, it is sewn binding. And like I mentioned, 128 pages and a flat spine right there. But that is the Dying Star. This is the book that I was talking about that I thought was released in hardcover, but it's the only soft cover in this batch. But it's this thick soft cover and it's got a french flap on the back and in the front here maryland's monsters man i hope i do this one justice so this is by tommy Ridolfi, and it, i want to say it's a fantastical biography on marilyn monroe or coming from norma jean baker to becoming marilyn monroe but this is done in such a surreal style that it's it's really creepy all right so in this particular world yeah, it's this very cartoony intro right here and the intro kind of gives you a little bit of a heads up as to what is going to be found in these pages so it's this betty boop cartoon not sure if this was in the original cartoon or not because that that gets a little descriptive and a little dark so this is hollywood not hollywood and Hollywood is this magical forest, but also dark, where the founders are... That's where you can find those particular characters. And it's where a lot of people go to make their dreams come true. And we meet the character of Norma Jean right here. And she is heading over to Hollywood to try to make it in that particular world. Now, you're going to see captions here that says, like, Days Until M.M., it's chapter one, blurred. And MM means the transformation into Marilyn Monroe. Now, when Norma Jean is drawn, it's really interesting because she's kind of plain and the way that she's drawn is like in these dark colors, almost like she's matching the background, like she's part of that eerie background. And as most of you know, or maybe you don't know, uh, she does transition or transform because of plastic surgery. And, of course, legally changing her name to Marilyn Monroe to become one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. Now, this is where it gets creepy because, like I said, it's a fantastical biography, right? Like, So, a lot of these things happened. And then, of course, this is the artsy way of retelling these stories. But this particular founder... And this is really interesting because this is the guy that ended up owning the ranch that Ho uh, Hollywood is bu uh, built on, or Hollywood. So he was a real person. Cannot remember his name. Maybe it was Harvey? Something like that? But anyway, he gets obsessed with the set of lips. It's a picture that he found, and it's a set of lips on this woman. 
and he shares it with the rest of the founders. So the founders are these that group of people that kind of make dreams come true. They, they kind of make kings and queens in this forest. And they send out for Norma Jean to come to the forest. And they're the ones that kind of perform the plastic surgery on her. I love this part right here because this kind of foreshadows the way that Marilyn looks. After the surgery, she goes through this transformation. Now, the thing you're going to notice here is, of course, the colors. Remember when I talked about Norma Jean here and how she kind of blends in with the background? Marilyn Monroe is the exact opposite when she's introduced. When Marilyn steps out, it's like she is always having a spotlight on her. Almost like she's a star, like a physical star herself, which is the way a lot of people saw her. What this story does, though, is it tells this really dark side of Marilyn's past in a very artsy, metaphorical style. This is when she's being interviewed at The Tonight Show. And this is what I mean by artsy, metaphorical way, where the interviewer is just like this smiley face but a really creepy smiley face introducing her and he's asking her basic questions like hey how's norma doing and he kind of throws her off and she's like i i don't know what that means and he's like oh man what a sense of humor those snappy comebacks so this is the type of art style you're going to be seeing here and again you know there's things take a lot of liberties taken with this one because there's a lot of horror elements in her past a lot of the things she dealt with and a lot of the monsters that are in her closet that also come out to haunt her when she's turned into this star this beautiful star that is adored by millions you see her uh, actual love interest in here you're, you're gonna see people like joe dimaggio through these pages but again, taking a lot of liberties with these stories. Now, what I really enjoyed about this is that it starts changing art styles to this, like, kid scribble drawings right here. As it's telling it from the perspective of this young girl. And this is just a genius way to me to tell an amazing, creepy story. I mean, obviously, from the cover, you, you kind of get the notion that, oh, this is not going to be your typical biography, but... There's just something eerie about her big head and uh, her eyes. Oh, man. I really like, like this is a good story. It's dark and creepy and it just kind of went in ways I didn't expect it to go. And I'm not really that familiar with Marilyn Monroe's past. And it kind of makes me want to go and read some of her stories. I, I mean, other than the movies I've seen about, I think it was actually called Norma Jean Baker. It was on HBO. So made for HBO movie. I really don't know much about her. I mean, outside of the movies that she was in. But to me, this was a great read. This is 248 pages, and the book retails for $29.95. And I didn't even mention the creator behind this. This is Tommy Rodolfi. And so it has been translated from the original comic that he did. I think the original comic was called Holly or Hollywood. Like the place where she's going. Yes, and that's of course Hollywood. But Marilyn's Monsters. Gurvan. Man, I really enjoyed this one. But probably for different reasons that everybody else did. This reminds me of like a 90s anime OVA. Which they adapted a lot of French novels then in the 90s. And maybe that's why it reminds me of that. But this is Gurvan, A Dream of Earth. And it is adapted from a novel. It's adapted from the novel by P.J. Heralt. It's written by Matthew Marole. And Livia Pastore is the artist. Hugo Fagicio is the colorist. So the basic premise of this is, in the distant future, Gurvan is a clone of a long line of clones that they're pretty much created to be the perfect mix to go and fight and die in this constant war that has been going on for years up in space. And he's sent to the, oh, what is the name of the ship? The Mat, uh, Mat, Matare, Matereru, um, the Mate, Materedu, I think is how it's pronounced. Probably not. But this is where Gurvan has been. He's never been to Earth and he's never breathe like real fresh air and he's here with his friend this is Sabal 
and together they are now on a new ship and then they're on a mission. Now his mission is to stay here and fight for seven years, to put his seven years time in of just non-stop fighting against the enemy and as long as he survives, he gets his reward, which is heading over to Earth and living out his years. Now, there are certain rules when he's here. They can't uh, have sexual relations because there's a chance of inbreeding because they are clones, even though it gets really tempting. <laughs> so I found that really interesting. Uh, now, some of those rules are, of course, broken. Now, he gets to meet his crew here. He's under... This is Captain uh, Rawl. And he gets to meet DG, DJI, which is one of his crewmates. The really interesting thing about this is that, you know, I've seen stories like this before where these soldiers are just heading out and fighting this fight. None of them are asking really any questions as to why they're fighting. They're just fighting and they're paying their seven years so they can go and live out their lives, you know, not just be clones up here in space fighting this endless war. But this is an enemy that no one really knows why they hate. So it gets really interesting because what ends up happening here is he gets to see the face of the enemy. He's in a dogfight up in space with one of the enemies and they both crash land on a planet. And it's not like Enemy Mine, which I love that movie. Um, there's a lot of twists and turns, but the enemy, I'll just uh, call that particular enemy X. He gets to know X and to see exactly what X's planet is like. And my gosh, this one I really enjoyed, like I said, because it reminds me of that 90s anime. Let me see if I can flip through here so you can see a little bit more of this beautiful artwork, like the splash page. But yeah, what I liked about this one is this whole secret. Why are they fighting? And when you find out exactly who the enemy is and how alike we are to the enemy, I say we because, well, these are Earthlings in the future, rather than get, regardless that they're clones or not. But anyway, um, you see our similarities. And it, I think it's a really good story. I like stories like this where you get to see all both sides of the war. All right. All the way in the back, you have some sketches. So here's Gurban, Gurban, DJI. That's his buddy. Uh, this is his friend from the beginning, Sabal, and then Captain Rao. I'm skipping the design of X, so you can find out for yourself what they look like. This is the uh, their ship, the Earth ship, the Predator, and then this is the enemy ship, the Vagabond. Now, this book right here has 120 pages, and it retails for $24.99. This one is, again, a hardcover, and it does have a round spine, so it's not like the dying game, and it is sewn binding. Legends of the Pierced Veal, the Scarlet Blades. I am so happy that Humanoids realizes a lot of these books are out of print. Like, we're, we're going to be looking at the Johto library here in a little bit. But this is part of the Pierced Veal series. Now, there's three of these, and I'm going to be covering two of them. And then the third one comes out later this year. But these have been previously released. Now, these were previously released just by their original names, like the Scarlet Blade or Izuna, which I'll do a little comparison here in a second. But, oh my gosh, I had to get this. When I saw this, I saw this at a comic book store, and I had no idea what it was. I saw it was a slipcase. So, when Human always releases these books, like this slipcase here, uh, they tend to be really limited and go out of print quickly, unfortunately. So they get really expensive after a while. Anybody that's ever looking for those <laughs> Incal coffee books, the original ones. Oh my gosh. Uh, but this was released and I fell in love with this world. This is all done by Saverio Tanuta. And at first glance, I'm sure most people are like, oh, it's a manga. This comes with a ribbon here. But let's focus on this version. So this is the new version that this has been out of print for a while. And then eventually, I think, oh, no, it was originally released in four albums because this is all four albums. That's the way they released them in Europe instead of like issues or or original. I guess they're more like original graphic novels, but they call them albums. So these are all four albums and just wrapped up in a one. So th this is all written and drawn by Saverio Tenuta. And as I was saying, at first glance, I'm sure most people are like, oh, it's like a manga. That's why I've heard some people compare this to like Lone Wolf and Cub and, or Blade of the Immortal, I think is what I saw somebody when I was on Omnibros. Somebody in the chat was talking about that. 
Yeah, I don't see that because it's a little bit different than that. So here's your main characters. You have Raido, who's the main character, Meiki, who's telling the story, Jera, Ogi, Toketu, Toteku, Fujiwara. These are all the main characters. And it's a really interesting way uh, to introduce these particular characters because there's a lot that you're thrown in. As I mentioned, this is all broken up into four different uh, albums, but it's one main story. So the first chapter is the city that speaks to the sky. And in here, you're being told a story by a puppeteer. Somebody is playing with the puppets and they're talking about the origin of the Scarlet Blades and how the Scarlet Blades must be protected at all times because if it gets into the wrong hands, then they can manipulate the entire world, which nobody wants that, right? So in here, we meet the character of Raido. And Raido is this Ronin, so a master, masterless samurai. And he's missing an eye, he's missing an arm, and his body is kind of falling apart. And he's roaming feudal Japan, Japan. for his memories. So this is where he meets the character of Beiki, who's the puppeteer and the storyteller. And then she has her own secrets. And then when you get to the ending, it's all kind of revealed and how it's all about legacy and all about destiny. But not just Raido's legacy, but his father's and, of course, the Scarlet Blades are all thrown in there. Now, what I was saying is, at first glance, I'm sure most people are like, oh, it's like a manga. So this honestly is more like Ronin. If you've ever read Frank Miller's Ronin, it's definitely a book that's inspired by... Japanese lore or manga or anime, but with some kick-ass scenes in here, some wonderful character designs. Um, it's got this painted art style that I just fell in love with. That I'm get, I'm, I'm happy that they're bringing it back to print in this hardcover because people now can experience it for the first time. And this introduces you to the world of the Pierced Veal. The Mask of Fudo will be the last book, and that comes out later this. I believe it's later this year. But this is the Scarlet Blades. Let's look at the extras all the way in the back. And yes, these are the Azuna, which we'll talk about here in a second, that play a part in this. And the end sheets. So the book has 200 pages, and it retails for $29.99. And it does have sewn binding. And let's go ahead and check out the next... Legends of the Pierced Veal, and it is Izuna. So this one also retails for $29.99. Now, this one has been previously released in these two oversized editions. But as soon as I saw the name Saverio Tenuta and I saw the Izuna, the big wolves here, I was like, oh, I definitely have to get that because I loved Legend of the Scarlet Blade. So it's the same art style. Let's actually focus back on this particular version but this all takes place in the past of this particular world so yes it is this mythical tale that's based on a lot of feudal japan legends uh, this one takes place in the past though but you do see the same type of creatures like the Izuna, who are like the guardians of this particular realm right here which is almost like heaven and what's happening during this time is, and now the Azuna themselves are descendants of other creatures, which you'll get to learn more about here. They're being attacked by the Nogo, and the Nogo is like this darkness that is coming, and one of their own gets killed. And they're protecting this particular tree, and that's what jobs their jobs are, to protect uh, this tree against all these evils that are coming from this particular era in Japan, and this darkness that is called a Nogo is coming to attack the spiritual plane now this tree gives birth to more izuna so more this is how the wolves are born however one day this is where it gets really interesting this is where they give <laughs> the tree decides to give birth to a different type of izuna cub this time around it's a human child so this human child is now part of the Azuna clan. And I thought that was really, like, it really, oh, it's got me. Now I want to know exactly what happens. So this young baby's name is Aki. 
Inaki will grow with the Azuna and make friends with some of them, like Kenta. And together they'll go on this journey. Now, another part of this is the in the human world, this is Kenshin. He's been tricked to kill all these innocent people right here. A bunch of monks. He's having visions of Aki. He can see her. And everybody else is wondering what exactly he's seeing. And it turns out that he is very blessed that he can see these spiritual creatures to begin with. Whether it's Aki or the actual Izuna. So in this particular time, there's a war that's about to happen. Not just in the human world, but also in the spiritual realm. So now it's both up to Aki and Kenta to save both realms, but also Kenshin and his people too. So this one is really good. I really appreciated how it tied it into the Scarlet Blades. And I'm interested to see where the... I haven't. That's the one I haven't read yet, is the Mask of Fudo. And that's all tied into this particular story. Let's look at the back for some extras. So you have sketches and different illustrations, samurai illustrations. So this book retails for $29.99. Here's your end sheets. And it also has 200 pages. And it is sewn binding with this really thick paper, glossy paper stock they're using. And it's come to be that part of the episode where we look at each and every one of these spines of the books that have come out recently. And this is the way they're going to look on your shelf. Well, not like this, but standing up rather. But these are the different spines of all these books. And always reminding people to smash that like button if you haven't done so yet. Now, let's go ahead and get back to the overviews. Lugosi. The Rise and Fall of Hollywood's Dracula. This is by Koren Shadmi. And he is the gentleman that wrote the uh, Twilight Man. And Twilight Man is one of my favorite freaking graphic novels I've ever read. And I'm, I'm so glad that they decided to publish this book right here. So let's go ahead and crack it open. We have these red end sheets right here. And Koren Shadmi Lugosi, The Rise and Fall of Hollywood's Dracula. So this is a foreword by Joe R. Lansla uh, Lansdale. And he talks about, you know, you're in for a treat regardless of whether you know everything there is to know about Bela Lugosi. Or whether this is your first time ever hearing about him or you just love graphic novels so you wanted to read this one. But regardless, you are in for a treat. And it starts off in Los Angeles, 1955. And we see this old man enter a rehab clinic, a Hollywood rehab clinic, because he's admitting that he's an addict. And he's addicted to morphine, as you find out a little bit later. And you find out exactly why and how it all started. But he introduces himself as Bela Lugosi. And so the nurses are going around and they're like, oh my gosh, is that him? Is that, could that be? And... Yes, and this is his story. So in here, he's fighting off his addiction. The doctors are coming in. And then you start seeing flashbacks of his life in Hungary, where it all started in 1893, when he was a young boy. Uh, how he was just playing pretend. But he always had this idea, right? Like this dream of being something else. He, His father was ashamed of him. So his relationship to his father wasn't the best and then when his father passed away they kind of send him or his mother really sent him off different places she wanted nothing to do with him because his father was just ashamed of him and there's just a beautiful tragedy to all of this that made him who he is but in here you're going to see his escape from Hungary to going through different places in Europe to coming to America while he is here fighting his demons and all these people from his past that have affected him as he's lying in bed there at night fighting off his addiction and you see him travel the world and then build a career uh, becoming a somebody that performs in plays and then of course becoming somebody that will come over to America and well, he he really did have a thing for ladies though <laughs> I will say that he, I can't I don't think by the end I've only read this one time I loved it this is definitely one of my favorite reads of the years you know what damn it before I go any further this gets the seal of approval oh my gosh if you're at all interested in this particular era of Hollywood or just the particular era in America you need to do yourself a favor and read this it's a beautiful tragic story about the man that 
you know, made Dracula who he was for a lot of people. But what I was going to say is that, yes, he was really uh, popular with the ladies, too. Might, might have been his accent. Then again, like, he was picking up chicks left and right in Hungary, so I don't know if it was the accent or not. But what I was going to say is that he, uh, by the end of this, I couldn't keep up with how many women he'd been married to. And some of them had the same first name, which I found really interesting. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole book. I really want to because I love this book. And this will definitely be in my top 10 at the end of the year. I just, I fell in love with this. Same way I fell in love with The Twilight Man. But this one for different reasons. Because this one breaks my heart because you get to see how Hollywood treated their actors and actresses back then. In a different way that Marilyn or Marilyn's Monsters was done. This is more of a biography. You get to see a chronological order of things through a series of flashbacks. But he gets kicked out of the hospital because he hasn't worked in Hollywood for three years. So they kind of kick him out because he's not part of the union and he's fighting that. And it's just so heartbreaking. He has no one to turn to. So he does like all these little bad choices with movies. And then you, of course, get to see him become addicted to morphine. It's a beautiful story. And if you're at all a fan of the Universal Monster era, definitely check this out too. The book retails for $29.99. Let's go all the way in the back. To check out the afterword by Gary Rhodes back here. And then some pictures of Bela Lugosi himself. This is, I think, his first wife? Yeah, this is his first wife, Ilona. And then, of course, roles that he played. I love the story behind this. <laughs> Why he had a hole in his head during that particular uh, movie. But it's all in here. The book has 160 pages. This is character studies right there. And then cover ideas. Boris Karloff makes an appearance through here. And you'll see other Easter eggs of famous movie stars back then. Hey, Twilight Man. You know what? That might be... I might add that to my best standalone graphic novels. 160 pages. It does have sewn binding. And it's printed in this thick, glossy paper. The latest in the Jodorowsky Library is Mad Woman of the Sacred Heart, which takes up most of this. Uh, you do have the wonderful talents of Mobius in here, but he's not alone. There's a couple of other stories which we'll talk about, but the big one, of course, is the Mad Woman of the Sacred Heart. So the Jodo Library is a collection of deluxe matching volumes presenting the iconic works of the legendary Alejandro Jodorowsky. So let's go ahead and open it up. I've done an overview of most of them, I think. This might be volume six. Maybe I haven't done an overview of volume five, but I haven't. I need to go back to that. Uh, so this one here has 304 pages. There's the Johto Library, Mobius, Bauk, and Meglia. So it tells you exactly who worked on what. Mobius, and oh my gosh, that took some years to make. Twisted uh, Tales is by Francois Bloch. And then Carlos Meglia did the debt. And that was a really quick... Like, both of those are really short stories. So, Mad Woman of the Sacred Heart is a really interesting story. I forgot to mention whether these have mature content or not. Uh, this one definitely has mature content because of the sexual situations in here. And there's a lot of that. Um, almost a, a character that is a sex addict through here. Alright. So, in here we meet the character of Alan Mango. And Alan Mango is a professor at this university. Oh, what is the university called? La Sorbonne, which is all of this, of course, is a metaphor for everything that happened biblically. Um, and you'll find out why the more you read it. So again, drawn by the phenomenal Mobius. However, it took some years for this to get made. So you'll see a change in his art style. Now, here on his 60th birthday, He's confronted by his wife, and his wife is telling him that she is leaving him, not for just any man, but somebody in his circle of friends. <laughs> and, and Alan is like, what the, the hell? At my own bar party, you're going to tell me you're leaving me? And yeah, she confronts him and tells him that she's done. She's done with him, and she wants to go and be with somebody else. So he kind of takes it pretty good. Now, we also meet this young lady named Elizabeth and Elizabeth is his um, young student now she approaches she this is the young lady right here Elizabeth who is just enamored by this guy right here this college professor who looks like this you can see a lot of Alejandro in that character by the way 
Sorry, you got to skip a little bit here because there's a lot of sex in this one. She tells him that they are destined to be together because he has to impregnate her with the second coming of John the Baptist. So remember when I said these are all metaphors for what happened biblically? Yes, there's a lot. And there's a lot of that in your face about it, especially when they get to travel the world. So that's what this is about. He ends up being part of this almost cult that wants him to fulfill this prophecy because their union is going to bring in the second coming of John the Baptist. So they go on this spiritually and I guess sexually charged journey, if you will. Maybe that might be the best way to describe that. Because they also get tied into this daughter of a Colombian drug lord. And there's the character of Muhammad that shows up through here. There's a lot of in-your-face allegories and metaphors in here. But the thing that you'll notice... I'm sure by now, is that the art style definitely changes when you start at the beginning. You have this classic Mobius, even the colors and everything. But then when you get here, there have been some years in between. I think it was a total of 7 to 10 years to finish this particular story. That's just the way European comics are done, right? It's not like monthlies here in America. They actually they put these out whenever they want to, whenever the time is right. This is definitely an interesting tale, but again, a lot of mature themes. A um, lot of, lot of Jodo tropes in here, and you know it almost becomes a self-parody of it of of life, if you will. But let's go to the next story, Twisted Tales. Twisted Tales is kind of like your fables. You have the story on one side right here, like this is the story of knowledge, and then on the right hand side you have the artwork by Francois Bloch. Uh, this is insane ideal, and there's not that many of them. There's a total of 42. And they're all there to, like a fable, right? To teach you a lesson, but a really dark and weird lesson. Now, the last story that's collected in here is this one here, The Debt. This is by Carlos Meglia. And this feels like a cartoon. And it's all how this young man right here is paying his father's debt. And it's just a few pages, so I can't even turn to the next page because it reveals what the debt is. He's just going to this particular restaurant where he's meeting like this underground mobsters, and he's there to pay his father's debt. And that's all I can say about that, because if I turned a page, it would reveal exactly what the debt is that he pays. In the back, these are the end sheets, and the book does come with a ribbon love it like the rest of the library editions and it has 304 pages let's look at the binding right there and it retails for 39 dollars and 99 cents yeah, i need to do an overview of that fifth one then project arca into the dark unknown now this is a bigger book than the other one so this is uh i don't think it's a volume one but it does leave it open a little bit uh, this one here retails for $24.99. I really like this one. Like I said, it was difficult to pick like which one gets my favorite pick of the week or seal of approval. Because th these were all excellent in their own ways. So this is written by Romain Benasaya and drawn by Joan, Joanne Urgil. And this is uh, based on the novel by Romain Benasaya. So that's really cool that he wrote the novel and then he wrote this adaptation of his novel. So in here you meet Officer Eric Rives. And this is all in orbit, uh, Earth's orbit 2182. You meet him and his sister Ariana. She's captain of the Ark 1 and he's just an officer in the Arca 3, not Ark 1. But yes, you get the idea that they're Arcs, right? Because they're escaping a dying Earth and they're going into the unknown. So what their mission is, is to go and find another world that they can live in, that they can go and inhabit. And it's this place called Leonis. It's they have to go into deep sleep, so they're all all the passengers are going into deep sleep for a few hundred years, and each of the arcs or arca has I think like fifteen hundred or so passengers. Now, just like any good sci-fi, 
they wake up and something is wrong. They have not reached Leonis and a lot more time has passed than the couple of hundred years that they were supposed to be asleep. So now it's this whole mystery of what happened and where are the stars because they're looking outside and they notice that it's nothing but darkness nothing but just pure black out there and you know he's looking for his uh lady uh, what is her name jo johanna right here who is the exobiologist and both of them are in the arca 3 now he wants to go and find his sister to see what exactly happened and if she's still out there uh, the artwork is absolutely stunning, like especially to have it in this huge format like this. Uh, this is a beautiful book. And we've seen the concept before of Earth dying and several ships have to f fly to the stars, right? And then whenever that destiny that they were going to, the destined planet they were going to, is nowhere to be found... They're now flout, uh, floating out in space with limited amount of time, right? I mean, it's kind of a little bit reminiscent of 2001, A Space Odyssey. I really like the world building in this book, though. I thought I think it was excellent. There's a lot of characters that appear through here. Uh, some of them don't make it. Oh, and the one thing I didn't mention is the these insect robots that have been helping them um, on the ship. Now, they themselves also have evolved into something else. So I find that really interesting too. Like it's part of the mystery. It's like what made them evolve and who is responsible for sending them to the wrong place. And can they still reach Leonis in and set the path that way? And what's going on with the stars? Why is it all black out there? Uh, this one here has mature themes in it as well. So just keep that in mind. And you get to meet more and more characters through these pages. And yeah, this whole mystery and... It almost feels like a good horror story, too. But this particular book, like I said, retails for $24.99, and it has 120 pages. And then we have some extra pictures back here in the back. Now, the very last thing, it does say the voyage continues, so maybe there's more coming? I'm not sure. Like I said, it's a European book, so who knows when uh, that will come. 120 pages, and it is... Sewn binding printed in this really thick, glossy paper. And that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsors. If you're in Europe and you're interested in buying these books, definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices, flat shipping rate of 12 euros for all EU countries, emails answer within 24 hours, waltzcomicshop.com, and you can use the code near mint condition at checkout and get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order over 40 euros. That's Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. Ding! CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of each of these books. Let me know in the comments down below if you are picking up any of these. If you're getting the Johto library in that format or you're looking for the out-of-print books. And yes, what other books you want to see from overseas being published by Humanoids. Translated and published. I would love to know all those comments down below. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. And we are on Patreon and spread shop amazing ways to support the channel if you can do so. More importantly, all of you stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.